his impact on catalysis. Uh, I met him uh, in early 1970s and at that time he uh, declared to me uh, this hydrocarbon catalysis uh, is going to be over soon, you should work on alcohols. And uh, starting at that date uh, we put in proposals uh, into NSF and DOE and uh, we did not make the alcohol research a major portion of catalysis research. Um, it still is hydrocarbon research. <laughs> but uh, at least we had a start. Uh, and so I'm grateful to Keith Hall for my participation in alcohol research. Now, the professional relations with Keith are not always without problems. Uh, he. Uh, if you read catalysis literature, no matter where you enter that literature, there's some paper by Hall et al. before them. So not only the copper zinc work, uh, which was a classic, but also if you look at uh, state of copper by luminescence in insulating solids, for example, there's a Keith Hall's work there. And of course, there's a volume of work on molybdenum catalysts uh, coming from Keith Hall's activities and laboratories. Uh, the other problems with uh, Keith Hall are that he actually, in a friendly way, keeps a tight rein over the catalysis uh, uh, culture here uh, through the editorship of General Catalysis. This is how it goes. Uh, you get a telephone call from Keith Hall and he says, Camille, I've established a new rule. The rule is that the speed of publication in General Catalysis is going to be proportional to the speed of your refereeing. And, uh, 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 by the way, uh, you, you have K1291 uh, for one month, K1231 uh, for six weeks, and manuscript K1242 uh, uh, for two months. Would you please deliver? <laughs> uh, I'm sure that there are many people in this audience who got this kind of telephone call. Uh, we appreciate the leadership, and I personally appreciate the suggestions that people made to me. Now, I'm not going to talk today about the major activity that we're involved in in higher alcohol synthesis that uses uh, the alkali doped copper catalyst, but instead I'm turning <coughs> to something that is relatively new, and that is an alcohol synthesis over what would be in petroleum industry considered HDS catalyst hydrocarbon catalyst. And if you look at uh, early literature, you will find that uh, sulfides such as molybdenum, the tungsten sulfide or even rhenium sulfide, occasionally used as hydrogenation catalysts. They are rugged, uh, very rugged, under the, at least under the conditions that we are using them now. And there's a major invention that uh, in an, uh, it was announced in 1984 by Dow Chemical Company that uh, shows that uh, when you dope these catalysts with alkali, instead of having hydrocarbon reactions occurring on them, uh, these catalysts will perform alcohol synthesis. And uh, the alcohol synthesis will be primarily methanol synthesis followed by some chain growth. Uh, I quote uh, the invention here in references uh, to Dow chemical but also to union carbide. In both cases, uh, alkali are essential components as well as molybdenum disulfide of those catalysts. Now, when we started, we already had a uh, uh, work in progress on uh, the copper catalyst, uh, where we studied the whole, systematically, the whole series of the light alkalis and uh, heavy alkalis. And in, uh, we determined on the, those copper catalysts that cesium is much better for you uh, than the lithium or sodium. And so we really, instead of uh, reproducing, which we initially did, uh, the uh, Dow chemistry, with, which was done with potassium, we started with cesium. And here is the catalytic pattern uh, of uh, the synthesis, depending on cesium loading. The pure molybdenum disulfide is no catalyst for alcohols at all. It uh, make, is a moderate catalyst for making methane primarily from carbon monoxide and hydrogen. As one dopes uh, this uh, solid more with cesium, 
which is introduced in this case in the form of cesium formate. Uh, we make alcohols, primarily methanol, then when one overdose, one makes less uh, methanol in parallel to the methanol, uh, while hydrocarbon uh, production is suppressed, <coughs> parallel to methanol production is ethanol production in some higher alcohols. Uh, we looked at uh, the kinetics of these reactions under a variety of conditions, variety of uh, cesium loading, and uh, we established a correlation which, which at this time I like to call an empirical correlation, which is fit by an equation where the total weight cesium loading appears in two ways. One is a constructive way and one is a non-constructive way indicating that the catalysts are bifunctional. In other words, as we add cesium, we promote some reaction, but as we add more cesium, we are retarding some other reactions. And this is a correlation between that equation of the variety of conditions uh, and the experimentally observed rate. All that this equation indicates is that, is that the catalyst is bifunctional, and it is bifunctional because if one adds cesium to the molybdenum disulfide, why does one does pro promote this alcohol synthesis in the first place? If one looks at the uh, moly disulfide catalyst doped with cesium at some intermediate concentration at which alcohols are produced at maximum, one sees this morphology. And this is different from many other catalysts which are doped with alkali, in which the alkali compound it disperses itself, itself atomically in sub monolayers at much smaller concentrations. Alkali are usually needed for, promote, for, for producing maximum synthesis rate than in this case. The cesium particles are about 200 tungsten particles. They are sitting on what appears to be flat portions of the moly disulfide by forces that are weak, as weak as the surface energy of the moly disulfide. And no matter what you do to this system, you cannot prevent this agglomeration and clustering of cesium. The catalysts are treated uh, at temperatures, pre-treated temperatures which are above the synthesis temperature. And you actually go through uh, the melting point of the cesium compound at 270 degrees centigrade. So this is a catalyst that uh, has been molten and uh, the cesium sits uh, on the polydisulfide this way. The interesting uh, thing that appears here is uh, a question that appears here. Why don't these cesium particles agglomerate at all? And that's a colloid chemistry question. And actually an intriguing one because thermodynamically stable situation would be one in which the cesium would be making one big blob. Uh, when I talk to my colleagues, colloid chemists, uh, they say, well, you can't have explain this by dipole repulsion uh, interaction. But there is a possibility that the cesium will hold the charge. That the cesium, which is a neutral compound to begin with, uh, it will just become charged, and a small amount of positive or negative charge will be sufficient to maintain this uh, dispersion. Uh, just an idea uh, which we pursued a little bit uh, by looking at a spectroscopy, this, this, uh, which somewhat uh, allows us to say something about those charges. In the moly sulfide alone, there is an electronic spectrum which uh, shows a big difference between an intercalated uh, alkali compound and the moly disulfide without the alkali compound. The difference between the two is that the intercalated alkali ion, which originally is not an ion, dumps an electron into MOS2 layer, and the MOS2 layer becomes negatively charged. Before that happens, there is a what is known as an exciton spectrum, which is essentially whose essential interpretation is a dumping of an electron from the sulfur into an empty orbital of the molybdenum 4 plus in that, and this means that it is, uh, it is associated with the presence of an empty state in the molybdenum. When one introduces these intercalating ions, then one obtains spectrum shown here, and that spectrum shows large absorption but disappearance of these transitions into the empty band. This is inter interpreted in the standard moly disulfide solid state literature as follows. You fill those empty states of molybdenum disulfide with the electrons coming from the intercalated ion, and then 
uh, those states that are then pumped into higher states with low energy that, that is responsible for this large background, but because they are filled, the transition into those states does not occur. And in fact, uh, studies have been made with sodium intercalated and the whole concentration range was covered. Now what happens uh, in the real catalyst that we have? Uh, these, uh, this is the interpretation of those two transitions. This is basically a DZX and DYZ orbital empty of the molybdenum disulfide. If the transition is into the empty orbital, there's a peak. If uh, the, the states are filled, there's empty, uh, there are plenty of opportunities for the electrons to be excited by low energy transition and that kind of gives rise to the background that I was talking about. Uh, this is a section of a regular structure of polydisulfide. Of course, in surfaces uh, there will be some sulfur vacancies and so on. I'll talk about this a little later. But this is basically the interpretation of that, uh, of that exit or transition. If uh, we look at the real catalyst, and I was impressed with the difference between single crystal and real catalyst shown by the xenon experiment, <coughs> we actually do see that uh, exit on transition. It is slightly shifted uh, in energy down, as if uh, the molydisulfide were perturbed. This is the molybdenum disulfide itself, and this is the molydisulfide with a CZ. What happens upon doping of our cesium, which is not intercalated, we know for sure that our cesium is not intercalated, it's extracalated. Uh, it's not intercalated because there is no change in diffraction that we follow carefully. But what happens is that uh, the background that was expected from filling the upper states of molybdenum is enhanced, but the states uh, into which the transitions occur are not empty. So the obvious conclusion is that the molydisulfide is partially charged, that the excited molydisulfide states are partially filled, and we have perhaps, uh, this is not definite, but perhaps we have a little bit of evidence that what happens in between those cesium clusters, molydisulfide, is that this, as the cesium clusters get a little bit reduced, electron is dumped into the molydisulfide layer, and this is the cause of, the, of this change of the electronic spectrum. That does not mean that the states of molybdenum that are involved in chemistry actually are altered all that much. They are partially occupied with electrons and still to major part empty. They are not altered much because these shifts here which would indicate how these states are altered are only of the order of 160 <coughs> wave numbers which is uh, 2 times 10 to minus 2 electron volts. Uh, incidentally, optical spectroscopy has that resolution you would not see this kind of shift uh, by any electron spectroscopy that is available today. Perhaps in the electron uh, spectroscopy of the near future, these shifts would be uh, uh, detectable. But that's a kind of shift that does not really, 2 times 10 to minus 2 electron volts is 0.4 kilocalories per mole. Essentially what we have is a mole state which is essentially the same even in the, in the presence of the cesium as the moly before, except that it, it is to some extent occupied and <coughs> to large part still unoccupied. That's the knowledge that we generated about moly disulfide, and as usually we have the great difficulty in relating this to catalysis, and that, that will come later uh, in my talk. In the copper zinc system that we studied earlier, we actually observe similar maximum, as I reported to you, on the molydisulfide with cesium. But in this, uh, in, in this system, minuscule amount of cesium is necessary for producing such a maximum. And that uh, maximum is sure shown here on two catalysts. It is maximum that in this system promotes methanol synthesis by cesium doping. And if you compare these levels, they are orders of magnitude lower than the levels of cesium in the uh, molydisulfide system. And the reason for this is that the cesium disperses. We have evidence, which will in detail be presented by Gary Simmons tomorrow, that the cesium is atomically dispersed in, into uh, the submonolayer, which is of the order of 22 to 25 percent of coverage at the optimum concentration for the maximum synthesis. So we have two catalytic systems which uh, on the surface behave similarly, but one in which the agglomeration of the cesium is great, it's a bifunctional catalyst, another system in, 
in which the dispersion of cesium is phi. It's also a that phi function colloid. What does the cesium do in the first place? We have a uh, uh, evidence by high pressure IR spectroscopy on the copper system that formates the R form very readily between say cesium hydroxide and carbon monoxide. This is nothing new in this business, but on copper zinc catalyst, the formate frequencies are shown here. As soon as we add these 20% of surface coverage of cesium, the formate frequencies are clearly associated with cesium only. The cesium takes over the formate chemistry on these catalysts and nothing is present on the uh, remaining copper zinc oxide formate type. And in fact, uh, uh, the rates with which these cesium formates are formed, these are incidentally uh, frequencies that are within wave numbers away from reference cesium formate from uh, compounds that are known. And so what happens is that the activation of carbon monoxide is really taken over by the cesium, and that is the essential effect of the promotion of uh, the carbon monoxide activation. Now what happens with the hydrogen? The hydrogen activation is in fact at high cesium concentration suppressed because simply cesium is plugging more and more of that surface. So that's our picture, and it's uh, essentially the picture for both catalysts, except for the fact that with the molydisulfide, <coughs> the morphologic uh, situation is more complex because of the hydrophobic nature of molydisulfide catalyst with respect to the cesium compound. Now that cannot be fixed easily to, if you, can, if you want to concoct some way of uh, dispersing the cesium atomically on molydisulfide uh, surface, it's going to be very, very difficult. The, where is the cesium on the copper catalyst? Uh, it's uh, dispersed primarily on the zinc oxide phase. It's not uh, on the copper particles. This picture comes from combined XPS electron microscopy study, and we were allowed in to publish rather quickly in Journal of Catalysis evidence. There are copper centers which are centers for irreversible CO chemisorption, whereas the copper particles here only uh, can absorb uh, CO reversibly. That is the uh, actually approach that we we, we followed uh, from uh, Nixon's uh, work on the reversible and irreversible hydrogen chemisorption. Let me now add one other component that is, with, uh, that is a major Dow's invention into the homolidized sulfide, and that is cobalt. The invention is Dow's in this sense because simultaneous presence of cobalt and alkali are uh, the ones that make alcohols in yet another composition uh, than I mentioned before. Remember that the system was making methanol and considerable amount of ethanol. With the cobalt, you will see that the selectivity is reversed and uh, there will be meth eth ethanol at maximum and methanol will be uh, a minor product because of reactions that are induced by the cobalt. So basically what this is is an HDS catalyst uh, with uh, the cesium or potassium compound on it. The potassium compound is essential to make methanol in the first place and then the reactions that follow are uh, running on the rest of the catalyst. Uh, where is the cobalt? Uh, there's an extensive uh, work uh, done on the HDS catalyst. Uh, this is a model due to Raschianelli, Topso, and so this is a schematic model, but it is believed that in these uh, catalysts, cobalt is closely connected with the molybdenum disulfide lattice. In a uh, recent work, Ledoux et al. have done NMR, uh, NMR study, in which uh, they, uh, it was a quite sophisticated NMR experiment uh, in which uh, uh, they found tetrahedral type of cobalt and octahedral type of cobalt, and this could be named as a modified Kianali model in which they in inter interjected between molydisulfide and the active uh, tetrahedral cobalt and other octahedral cobalt in this situation. That was prompted simply by the NMR observation. I don't think that there is a structural evidence that the structure really looks like this. But the alkali cobalt molecatalyst looks um, like the cesium doped catalyst before with blobs of cesium aside and in addition to these edge cobalt sites. So now we have a catalyst which is at least three component, and in fact, uh, that catalyst is three functional, not bifunctional. 
Um, uh, let me introduce uh, a few results here on an MR study of these catalysts. You recall uh, that there was some ethanol made. But we might be interested, and we were interested in how, to, how do you convert that ethanol, how is that ethanol formed in the first place, and how do you convert that ethanol to higher alcohols. And that is what happens in both of these systems in, in, with entirely different <coughs> chemistry on each of the two. Uh, let me first show that uh, NMR, when you simply, this is not a solid state NMR or surface NMR, this is an NMR of the product which has been collected after C13 compound has been injected in the, into the system. Remembering the old work with C14, uh, NMR gives us a great tool in uh, which we can distinguish between the individual uh, types of carbons without separating the alcohol mixture. This is a just native NMR of uh, methanol, which is a uh, 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 C13 shift here, ethanol labeled here, this is the NMR of that carbon, ethanol labeled uh, on the outer carbon is showing here, and up to butanols and isobutanols, every carbon is, or up, actually up to the pentanols and their isomer, every carbon can be distinguished by NMR quantitatively plus or minus relative 5% uh, in the mixture of the product. So that is a, a tool that we have employed for the studies of both the moly-sulfide catalysts, which are doped with alkali, and cobalt moly doped with alkali, and then I will compare briefly these results with the copper zinc oxide stuff. On the moly disulfide, uh, first thing, we did not really inject the C2 compound, we inject labeled methanol. Uh, methanol, as you remember, is a major product, but we have injected uh, such an amount of methanol that there was a major proportion of label, C13 label on that methanol. First of all, in the presence of cesium, we observed that the isotopic enrichment of the methane, you remember that methane was suppressed uh, on that cesium, but that isotopic label has exactly the same composition as the isotopic label of the injected methanol, which means that methane in this case is a secondary product uh, of hydrogenolysis of methanol. It's a minor product, and the beneficial effect of the alkali is that the product, that product goes down. Uh, the ethanol that was formed uh, had a label exclusively on the outer carbon and no label on the inner carbon. Uh, that is a kind of a chemistry that perhaps I see Dr. Zuckler here that uh, could be read in his Berlin uh, lecture. Uh, and I will get uh, to that. In fact, the chemistry that I'm going to describe is, is, is different in only one small, uh, small uh, feature, and that is uh, the feature what happens after ethanol. After ethanol, on the cesium molydisulfide catalyst, we, get the, we carry the label through on the outer carbon, and these carbons are made from the step, stepwise addition of the synthesis gas. But on the cobalt, uh, catalyst this time doped with potassium, the label appears equally on both carbons, uh, C2 and C3, and no label appears on C1. That's a little bit of a twist uh, to the simple chain growth as we expect from, say, carbon monoxide insertion. Uh, this would be the mechanism. First of all, the me methanol generating mechanism would be the formate mechanism employing the alkali salt, and we're not concerned with that at this moment. This uh, alcohol is labeled though, it's a source of C13. It becomes possibly an alkyl that sticks to a metal center such as the molybdenum center, and then uh, and by a blue slow process over the cobalt free catalyst and fast process on the cobalt containing catalyst, uh, we get CO insertion. And the sole product on both catalysts is ethanol that is labeled only here, on the outer, outer carbon. But then, uh, in the following step, remember there was a difference. The red labels are the labels of the cobalt alkali catalyst, and the blue label was the label on the cesium. So let's take the simpler case, forget about this part here, and let's insert into the blue label here, 
a, another CO and get the product as it appeared in the internet market. So this stepwise chain growth uh, would be the chain growth of the cesium doped polydisulfide catalyst in which uh, we have no cobalt and there is no extraordinary rate to this reaction, although the reaction is faster than the subsequent reactions here because the ethanol is produced at a significantly higher rate that would so, correspond to, say, uh, the schulz florian distribution. So this is a, a, a system that is near the schulz florian uh, uh, distribution, with the exception that this reaction is a little faster than the rest of the chain. Now, to explain the both labels in the case of cobalt catalyst, uh, we have to turn over this alkyl if the mechanism goes by the same uh, path. And uh, to turn over this alkyl, we either desorb and reabsorb ethylene, incidentally ethylene is a co-product in that reaction, or we can think of mechanisms where this alkyl isomerizes itself so that the top carbon cups on the bottom and the bottom carbon on the top. And that is promoted uh, whether uh, what the specifics of the mechanism is, we, we don't of course know, but that is promoted specifically in the system by cobalt. Uh, but the major, uh, major uh, effect of cobalt is really here to make this reaction, this first insertion, very fast. And that is, that is what uh, maximizes the product composition in ethanol. Even with cobalt, this second step here is slow. And that is further uh, indication that after ethanol, you have bottlenecks and uh, the, the synthesis proceeds relatively slowly. This is all consistent with what is known in organometallic chemistry about CO insertion reactions. Uh, CO insertion into alkyl metal is fast, a methyl metal bond is faster than into ethyl metal bond and so forth and so forth. So this looks like organometallic chemistry, although it is realized on a system that uh, does not look like a, a traditional organometallic catalysts. Uh, now, I want to take a few minutes extra to compare the system with the copper thing. And, uh, before doing that, uh, this is the classical chain growth mechanism. Uh, FICO insertion of the alkyl metal bond. Methane is a secondary product. Cobalt greatly enhances that C1 to C2 step and the synthesis patterns over those two catalysts are similar and dissimilar in, in, in the sense that I talked about before. This leads to a product distribution on the two catalysts, one that is doped with cobalt, one that is not. Uh, the blue is a molybdysulfide cesium catalyst. You realize, uh, maybe from this graph, that already the higher alcohols are at high yields here, 25% carbon percent of ethanol is already a significant yield of higher alcohols. If you look at the practical ends of this, and if you would use this as a, as a blending fuel or anything like that, the target being 30% of higher alcohols and 70% of methanol, already the cobalt free catalyst satisfies that requirement. But if you want to make ethanol, the cobalt catalyst is better. Here we have a cobalt catalyst, the red lines, uh, the ethanol is indeed maximized because of the fast C1 to C2 step and then the subsequent steps are slower. The, in, the in, in the butanol, the linear alcohol is at higher concentration than the branched alcohol, indicating that this linear chain growth still proceeds at a faster rate than uh, some branching reactions which occur in other systems effectively. Hydrocarbons uh, are still C1, uh, even, even though that the alkali suppressed the hydrocarbon main, there's still a significant amount of methane formed over these catalysts, and of course, uh, that might be a, a, a slight, uh, uh, let's not drawback, but uh, something that uh, certainly people who want to synthesize alcohols don't want. Uh, the comparison that I wanted to make with the copper zinc catalyst uh, is uh, displayed here. The reactions are entirely opposite here, and the flow of labels are entirely opposite to, and the product composition is entirely opposite to the molybdysulfide with cobalt or without cobalt. If uh, one injects, uh, in this case, we've done many of these injection experiments, and I'm pointing out only one that is really crucial to the understanding of this, this, this time, the C2 to C3 step, step which on this catalyst is the overwhelming uh, synthetic step. 
if one injects ethanol, this is oxygen, this is the labeled carbon, and this is the unlabeled carbon of ethanol. Remember that the C13 is here. This is the other uh, label of ethanol, which is low. This is the high label of the inner carbon. The subsequent product, propanol, linear propanol that one gets, has a major portion of the label on the outer carbon, not in the inner carbon, not in the middle carbon, but on the outer carbon. Whereas the middle carbon and the inner, inner carbon are low. What this means is the following. The C1 intermediate, which we believe to be aldehyde, adds itself on the beta carbon of ethanol, forms an oxygenated end here, and then this oxygen is kicked out by a mechanism which we call reverse aldol synthesis with oxygen retention on C1 intermediate. If we retain C1 oxygen on the C1 intermediate, we get that oxygen here. This is the C1 intermediate, and this is the turnaround ethanol, and the reaction is quite selective to this. This is a chemistry that is just opposite to what I showed you on the molybdite sulfide uh, catalyst uh, in, with, with the cobalt. This is also the chemistry that on the, that on the copper zinc oxide catalyst, Dr. Cesium, is responsible for the rapid utilization of ethanol. And I'll show you a product composition on this, these catalysts, which instead of having maximum et ethanol, there's a minimum et ethanol because of this chemistry. Here is the methanol over cesium copper zinc oxide catalyst. Here is ethanol. Propanol is higher than uh, methanol. And this alcohol, which is almost exclusively isobutanol, the branched alcohol, is at maximum among the C2 to the C4 alcohols. And the synthesis conditions can be manipulated so that it, it, in fact we get much more isobutanol in the system than methanol itself. Now, uh, the reason why, incidentally, the, uh, the dotted, uh, there are some esters here, and virtually no hydrocarbons. The dotted, uh, uh, the dotted bars are results of models uh, that we uh, mathematical models that are based on our understanding and knowledge of kinetics of these individual steps C1 to C2, C2 to C3. In here, the C1 to C2 is a bottleneck, and C2 to C3 <coughs> is rapid. On the molybdate sulfide, the C1 to C2 was rapid, and the C2 to C3 was a bottleneck. And um, so, despite the fact that the methanol formation is promoted by the alkali in uh, approximately the same way, the subsequent chemistry is different on these two catalysts. Now, in my last slide, imagine what you can do with these two systems. Uh, there's no doubt that the copper zinc oxide catalyst is still uh, the winner in methanol synthesis, the C1 synthesis. The co uh, cobalt molybdite sulfide is winner in C1 to C2. So what you can do is you can synthesize methanol of copper zinc oxide dump that methanol either in the same reactor or in two reactors onto the cobalt molybdate to get ethanol if you want to. If you don't want that ethanol and want a higher molecular weight product, you take that ethanol and dump it on cesium, copper, zinc oxide back to get these higher molecular products. So there's a great variety between these two systems in which you can manipulate the product composition for the purpose uh, that one might have. Our knowledge is summarized here. We have worked on these catalysts for years now, and we believe that we know a lot more about them than on the molecule. But the chemistry, like the CO insertion chemistry, appears to be simpler. So it was actually more expedient uh, to uh, do these NMR experiment. experiments. Experiments uh, like it was, uh, as you could see from the complexity of product distribution on the copper zinc oxide. The main products are metal, <coughs> the main, product, the main, main product of the DAOs, uh, this is ethanol. Both C, uh, methanol synthesis are alkali promoted or alkali essential. The alkali are essential on the dose do catalyst. In here, we already have a basic component, zinc oxide, which also promotes methanol synthesis by the formate mechanism, but by far less efficient part than the alkali promoted uh, uh, thing. And so, uh, the cesium has been kind of unexpected uh, benefit there because people in the literature, including patent literature, says that you can't promote methanol with alkali unless you uh, for maxes. These, this summarizes what I already said. The stepwise base catalyzed reactions use the aldol chemistry with oxygen 
one free retention. This is a zero insertion. We do have successful model, as I showed, for the copper and cesium, and the model for uh, this reaction is in development. That concludes my talk. Time for one question. Expulsion, which uh, uh, changes over from oxygen water to carbon water. Well, we don't have uh, acid catalyzed reactions at all. These catalysts are. Basically, there is some residual acidity. The acidity is killed with cesium, and that happens in the chromia system and so on. Now, you are asking, presumably, how that methyl group or alkyl group is formed on the moly catalyst, not on the oh, yeah. copper catalyst, because we don't believe that the methyl group or alkyl CO insertion is the mechanism on the copper catalyst. So, so how that happens is... Uh, Unknown to me, I think it happens by hydrogenolytic cleavage of the carbon-oxygen bond for which molybdenum disulfide is efficient, particularly in cobalt, and the hydrocarbons, higher hydrocarbon production is closely associated with it. I believe that we cannot make alcohol on these alcohols on these catalysts without making some hydrocarbons because of that mechanistic feature. So I think the mechanistic feature is hydrogenolytic or simply cleavage of CO bond in a methoxy, which is transferred to the molybdenum site or the cobalt site, whichever uh, takes over uh, that uh, part of the reaction. So it's on the molybdenum sites, not the cobalt sites? Pardon? It's on the molybdenum atoms, not on the cobalt atoms. Well, in the absence of cobalt, I have a feeling it's got to be on the molybdenum atom, because we don't have cobalt, but on the but the chemistry indicates that the cobalt has an essential role in its uh, C1 to CO insertion, so I would believe that the alkyl you know, well, the cobalt catalyst sits on cobalt, but we don't know the answer to that, of course. Thank you again, Neil.